welcome to the God is Not an Asshole podcast. If you are one of the many people done with religious dogmatism, hang on. You might sense transcendence, but your church or other faith community never seem to get off the ground. You realize that honoring your conscience means more than fitting in and keeping hard to explain rules? Hang on. You could probably think of the goodness in your tradition, and you tried your best to save that baby, but there's so much bathwater. Join your hosts, David Norman Moore Jr. in California and Carrie Connolly in New Jersey, who are collaborating to bring on guests who have found life on the other side of fundamentalism. Guests with stories of how they have liberated themselves from beliefs that divide us from each other. None of our guests' narratives are identical, but we hope you'll find something in common with each of them. We invite you to experience our common bond as we all inspire even more of us to embrace the true self. Everybody, we're here with uh, Rob Schenk, a name you may or may not recognize. Uh, I don't know how I came across Rob uh, several years ago. So I, I actually kind of feel like I, I know you, even though we've never had a conversation, and that's because... I think I started, um, I read uh, the book that you you wrote some years ago, uh, Costly Grace and, Eval- and Evangelical Ministers, Rediscovery of Faith, Hope, and Love. And, you know, I've just kind of followed you, you know, social media. And, you know, I watched uh, the movie, The Armor of Light, that, that you know, portrays, your your encounter with um with uh, Lucy Beth uh Jordan's mom uh Jordan was was shot and killed um and so you know you, the question arose can uh, a person be both pro gun and pro life and all of that kind of thing and you know i you know when i when I first thought of you as a guest, I was interested in in introducing you through the book because I mean I found it to be compelling I mean the whole narrative of you and abigail disney and and all of that uh and then and in the movie as well, but something happened since then that captured my attention that I think might be a good place to start um you you testified uh, at a House Judiciary Committee hearing on the influence of politics on the Supreme Court. When I say you testified, testified is the official word, but I think the actual term might be you confessed. Mm. Uh, it was it was more confessional than a testimonial, and I think I would like for you to take as much space as possible uh, in these moments that we have together. So, but can that be a jump, jumping off point and you just kind of tell everybody about what happened there? Sure. Well, first, thank you, Carrie and David, for your invitation. I've watched the, the uh, what do we call it? Show, podcast, convo, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, confab. Uh, and I really enjoy it. I must say the title stretches my um, evangelical sensibilities, but not entirely because I used to make a point when I would preach on uh, Philippians 3, 8, you know, where Paul says he considers, uh, St. Paul the Apostle says he considers all of his acts of righteousness as dung. And I would Mm -hmm. often say much to the scandalous reaction of my congregants when I would preach in uh, fundamentalist and holiness churches. And I'd say, now, folks, dung is a polite way of saying what the apostle actually said there. It was quite <laughs> scatological. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, yep. you know. <laughs> I got to get more biblical and you're helping me to do that. A little spicy language in the scriptures. Never heard anybody, right? (laughs) That's right. Some of those, some of those scriptural writers were pretty saucy in their language. Um, But yes, you asked me, David, about a very, very serious moment in time. Um, You know, uh, like you, I've been a preacher for a long time. I've preached uh, all over the world, and 
to audiences in the tens of thousands and at a single sitting, I was never as unnerved and disconcerted as I was during that uh, Judiciary Committee hearing. And one of the reasons was because the most hostile figures on that Judiciary Committee among the Republicans were members of Congress I had prayed with often. Mm -hmm. I had visited in their offices and even in their homes. I had shared many meals with them. I had gotten on my knees to pray with them, to read the Bible together. And I knew their secrets and they knew my secrets. And they were my most vicious opponents on that committee. And to a certain extent, I get it. I mean, their whole idea was, I'm a traitor. I've betrayed them. I've betrayed their secrets. So, you know, I'm married to a psychotherapist, so I get a lot of help and a lot of free therapy. <laughs> Although I do have to remind her, honey, I'm your lover, not your client. But anyway, <laughs> that's an insider thing. Um, but point is, uh, yes, it was time for me to make my confession. I spent 25 years in Washington, D.C. as a minister to elected and appointed officials. I was actually commissioned a missionary uh, to top-level federal uh, government figures, and that included presidents and many leaders of Congress and members, of course, but then also to the justices of the Supreme Court. And I spent 25 years coming and going from, from the court, uh, sometimes the inner chambers, the private, very private offices. There are the chambers of the justices and then the inner chambers. It's a little bit, if you know the biblical analogies, it's a mm. little like the temple, mm -hmm. the holy of holies, uh, the, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. And I was in all three uh, many times face to face, mostly with the conservative justices. For like, for instance, like, uh, and the late Antonin Scalia, that's kind of who it started with, then went to Clarence Thomas, spent most, more time with Clarence Thomas than anyone else. Uh, and uh, later, Sam Alito, uh, John Roberts, when they joined the court. Uh, I had had a little contact with the late Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who was kind of the first arch conservative appointed to the court. So the idea in those days was uh, to buttress their conservative sensibilities, to embolden them, to encourage them not to hold back, not, certainly not to compromise, but to render the boldest, most strident conservative uh, opinions sometimes we call them decisions, uh, that, that they were capable of delivering. And I had a, a particular way of doing that that I am not proud of. I'm, I'm, in fact, you know, I certainly feel regret for it. Um, I think it was corrosive. It was, it was harmful uh, to our democracy. It was certainly corrupting in terms of the court. Uh, and it was in violation of Christian ethics and sensibilities. And so I thought it was time uh, to tell that story to the public. It was a secret I had kept for a long time. I was told at the court, if you're going to work here, you must take what you see and hear to your grave. And we mean that literally you take it to your grave. You never speak of it. And I didn't. I slipped a couple of times, was severely rebuked for it. Uh, I learned my lesson quickly and I kept it quiet. But then some things happened, like the leak of a big decision on 
Roe v. Wade, the Dobbs decision. And that brought to mind another leak years before that I was a part of. I was a courier for a leak on a prior abortion case in 2014. And it troubled my, it, 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 it troubled me, you know, uh, isn't that, isn't that one of the great spirituals? He troubled me down in my soul. <laughs> uh, and, and I was troubled and, uh, but I can't claim to be brave because something got me out of my funk and my fear. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I don't want to take up the whole time with endless rambling here. So I, I should probably stop at some point and, and uh, give I my think, host uh, a chance. I think I, I, no, I think this is some of the best rambling I've heard in a long time. So, um, I would actually love to hear where you were about to go. You were about to say something, something you, you said, which I thought was a really interesting phrase. You said, I, I can't claim to be brave. Something moved me out of that. And um, I think what you've done is incredibly brave because I think betraying those in power is, is always, always dangerous and um, always costly. And so I think it was very brave. Uh, yeah. But I would love to hear what you were about to say uh, about what moved you out, what moved you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Carrie, I don't, you know, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say I was afraid of those people. I, I was afraid yeah. of them. Rightly you know? so. I mean, it, because there's one thing, it's one thing for, for me, for example, uh, to get into an argument with somebody about whatever social issue I might have and, and whatever cost I might have socially, the social cost of that. But what you're talking about is a whole other level of power, of danger, of cost, right? And and that's not to be taken lightly. It's not to be taken lightly at all. I mean the the it's 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 deep and it's deep. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. It was deep as is to this moment. Um, deep in in many ways, but you know we've heard Donald Trump, for example, say to the country, "I am your warrior, I am your retribution," and the people sitting in that committee on the Republican side very much feel that they are Donald Trump's soldiers. Mm -hmm. Um. And so whatever retribution he wants to mete out, they are prepared to execute it. And one of the ways you do that is, um, you know, by making, uh, by, by uh, forgive the pun or the whatever it is, borrowing of a term, trumping up charges, um, you know, mm -hmm. technically, I could have been charged with attempting to influence a federal judge. That's a felony of a, of a very high order. I could have been prosecuted. Uh, oh, hello, cat. <laughs> Sorry, that's Stella. <laughs> yeah, I'm a cat lover, so <laughs> nice, nice to see the other invisible host. Yes. Um, Stella. Um, but, you know, there were plenty of threats. I had been subjected, David, going back to the film that you referenced, The Armor of Light, you know, I'm routinely subjected to, uh, you know, I know where you live, I know what your wife does, I know where your grandchild is, you know, um, you're an instrument of Satan, you know, you're a, you're a socialist spy you know we know how to deal with you it's just routine regular flow of threats so you know my wife and i already live with security cameras and alarms and situational uh, consciousness you know we're always situationally aware we've been trained with that look for somebody standing by your car or the edge of your property you're in, in the back 
uh, where they don't seem to belong or car idling, you know, all of that. So that's how we live our lives. So, so when I said earlier about the cost, that there is a literal threat to your being, to your life, to your aliveness, right? There is literal, literal threat. So this is, this is not to be taken light. This is incredibly deep. And I, again, I just, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, of course, one way you deal with that is you say, well, there's a whole lot of people who live with much more serious threats who have literally you know, been physically attacked. And I will also say that those of us living with trauma are the first people to tell ourselves that other people have it worse. Hmm. So I just offer you the grace and the space to acknowledge the trauma that you're living with because it's very real and very valid. Well, and, thank and you. you mentioned that it, it was uh, the movie kind of uh, set people off. Now, I can't remember well, Costly Grace, your, your book, was that, wasn't that before the movie or after? After, just after. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just after. And it, again, this kind of goes to the to the original question, uh, or not the original, but where we kind of paused. I interrupted myself, which I have a bad habit of doing. But um, <laughs> you know what? What kind of dislodged me from my inertia? I, I was really getting ready to settle into an invisible life. Uh, I had subjected my family to a lot of trauma over the years because of living a very public and controversial life. And I had my first grandchild and I didn't want him to be subjected to the same thing with, you know, yeah. a grandpa in the headlines all the time. Oh, yes. So I was really starting to shrink back. And then I got a text from Abby Disney the Emmy award-winning director of the film, The Armor of Light, which was a big part of my journey, huge. Because David, I, you referenced, you know, when the, one of you referenced that question in the, in the film, how can you be pro-life and pro-gun? Or can you be pro-life and pro-gun? That was 2015, you know, we're already, uh, eight years yikes it's a classic now the film is a classic it should be on turner classics it's old and in the intervening eight years i now ask the question can you be pro-life and anti-abortion and there's a reason i ask it that way uh because i've come a long way since uh that uh, you know, moment in time for me. So there was, I, I don't want to go back into ancient history, but in, in 2009, I, I started separating myself a little bit from what I had been doing in Washington. Then in 2011, I took a leave of absence to finalize and write a doctoral dissertation on the subject of political idolatry. And during that time, by the way, I met Donald Trump at the 80th birthday party for Pat Robertson, the televangelist. <laughs> uh, and I, I knew then my religious community of evangelicals was in deep, deep crisis. And that's when I really started a separation that would have me eventually leave Washington, D.C. after almost 30 years being there and working on Capitol Hill. And I started to dial back all this secretive work at the Supreme Court because I had been running this clandestine operation. It was literally a covert operation at the court that we dubbed Operation Higher Court. I was bringing in wealthy major benefactors and donors, uh, matching them up 
to justice couples, as we call them, friendly justices on the Supreme Court and their spouses. What everybody now knows, it's all been exposed now, but, you know, with private jet travel and, uh, you know, posh resorts and other kinds of gifts and entertainment. And, uh, you know, in this way, insinuated ourselves into the private lives of the justices. Um, I, I would like to say, in an aside, it wasn't all bad or nefarious. There were some very meaningful moments. I heard confessions. I heard of distress. I heard of struggles with addiction in those years, and I offered what pastoral care and support I could. But the overarching goal was very harmful, and I would call anti-Christian. It was not an act of generosity. It was, in fact, supreme selfishness. We wanted to bring about our conservative agenda, and we knew the court was an invaluable component to that through the decisions they rendered from the bench. So it was, in the end, you know, it was a little bit like a therapist once said to me in a session. He said, uh, you know, sometimes I, I think of you, 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 you present a very lovely plate of cuisine, you know, very tasty and well-presented artistically. But, you know, when all it takes is just a tiny drop of dog shit on that plate, and you kind of ruin the whole thing. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> no matter how beautiful this stuff was, we had put plenty of dung <laughs> to use the, the acceptable mm. King James version of that word on the plate, and it just spoiled it. Um, so here's what happened. At the time that the Dobbs Roe decision was leaked, and everybody knows about that now, I confided in my collaborator of recent times, Abigail Disney, you know, who's when I met Abby, when when she came to me with the proposal to make the film The Armor of Light and examine my co-religionists, my fellow evangelicals' embrace of popular gun culture. We were diametric opposites. She had been for decades a women's rights advocate, pro-choice activist, um, had little to no regard for religion, and was probably as politically left as one could be and remain in America. <laughs> so, to her own admission. Um, so we were diametric opposites, and we would forge a very unlikely and very dear, dear friendship over that project. But I confided in Abby, as I often do, uh, about my conflicted feelings about what was happening at the Supreme Court and this leak. And the fact that I had been part of a previous leak. And then she texted me one day and said, I have an apology to make. I leaked your leak. <laughs> to, <laughs> okay. to, to the Pulitzer <laughs> Prize winning investigative reporter at the New York Times, Jody Cantor. Oh. <laughs> who, by the way, was, of course, the one who broke the... Uh, Harvey Weinstein story mm. and a great film out, uh, 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 you know, dramatic film uh, about that. And of course, she and her her uh, collaborator in that uh, wrote a magnificent book treatment of it. But anyway, that was so. She said, "Jody's going to be calling you," mm. and uh, and I winced and. We talked, and we've been public about this, so I'm not, you know, spilling the beans on her. I have her permission to talk about it. Um, but uh, now I will say, Jody Cantor is a consummate professional. She was extremely courteous. 
And um, she gave me, you know, uh, my, she respected my prerogatives. She said, you know, if you don't want to go public, that's fine. But we're going to do the story with or without you. And she said, I think it will be much better with you than without mm -hmm. you. So these two dynamic, powerful, brilliant, creative women kicked me in the, oh, there's that word again. <laughs> in the ovaries. <laughs> okay. yes. In, in, yes, the male compliment. <laughs> in the ovaries. Um, but got me out of my inertia because I had, at that point, I had decided to keep it a private matter between me and the Chief Justice of the United States, uh, John Roberts. And I penned a letter to him. I hadn't quite got the nerve to send it, but I was ready to mail it. And I wanted to keep it private. Um, but Jody um, and... Um, and her uh, colleagues convinced me it would be far better uh, if I simply went transparent. And it was an agonizing decision. I know I lost some weight over it. I know I ground a lot of molar, uh, you know, to, uh, whatever it is that coats your molars. I can't think of it, but just anyway. The enamel. The enamel, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I shaved off a lot of molar enamel. Uh, yeah. And I finally resolved, yes, it's time, time to go public. Um, I sent uh, Jody uh, tens of thousands of emails and documents. Uh, and can I tell you this? this really wild part of the story. Mm. One of the consequences of my departure from the old right-wing world that I had served for so many years was I was locked out of everything. I couldn't gain access to any of my private records, my personal records. All the servers that I had worked on over the years were blocked me from access. I mean, there was... There was retributive reaction okay. to all of that. So I couldn't get any of the documentation that the New York Times needed to do this expose. And then I remembered that I had a fried laptop that I worked on for about five of those critical years. And somebody had literally poured a cup of coffee in, as an accident into my, my, uh, keyboard so you can imagine how fried the thing was it was toast but i had kept it and it was in a storage unit and i went and retrieved it mm. and some it specialists looked at it and said no way on earth until we found a company in southern california who guaranteed they can pull data from anything <laughs> and they did <laughs> wow. pulled all this data wow. out, and we retrieved did they Tens. know what they were retrieving? My gosh, yeah. could you imagine? No, no, <laughs> not until after. Afterwards, we, <laughs> right. we, yeah. we gave them an a heads up what was coming down the pipe. Wow. Uh, in fact, I still have, they, they deserve a mention because they were so good. I have it right here, Drive Savers. <laughs> it's called Drive, Drive Savers, Savers. <laughs> in <laughs> L.A. It. In, in LA, LA, give them all it's your business. I data love it. recovery specialists. Wow. And they pulled it out. I got it all to the times. Everything was documented. Everything was verified. And I told this story. Uh, and I felt so relieved once it was out. And it was a big story in November of last year, 2022 in case you're watching this in, in 2032, because I know it has that much longevity with, with uh, the two hosts. Um, mm -hmm. It was a big story. It was front cover, front page, uh, uh, above the fold, and uh, as they say. Uh, and then, of course, it became a big media 
story across the country. And, uh, and then I was contacted by the Judiciary Committee for the House of Representatives, and I was eventually subpoenaed in what's called a friendly subpoena. I did not, uh, you know, I cooperated fully. I had no qualms about testifying for them, but there's a reason why uh, a subpoena is issued in those situations. Uh, and and I, I unveiled it. Uh, what what we had done, um, and it exacted a very high price, but I do not regret that. Uh, I I would do it again, and I probably will do it again uh, in the Senate. If the House, if Democrats reclaim the House, they'll continue the investigation. Republicans buried it, uh, but um, it'll, T- it'll tell us a on. little bit about the investigation. What what is this all about? Yeah, well, what this is, of course, is an investigation into undue influence on the justices of the court and the absence of a code of ethics. Uh, You know, we talk about three co-equal branches of the federal government, the legislative, of course, which makes the laws, the executive, which carries out the law, and the judicial which interprets the meaning of the law and the application of the law. So in the other two branches, you have very strict codes of ethics. Who has access to the decision makers? What they can and cannot do. Now, of course, you know, these boundaries are pretty elastic and they're pushed pretty far. by all the players, but they exist. And there are eyeballs on, you know, the actors. And as we've seen over history, you know, elected officials can be called to account and often are. The pinnacle of that is impeachment for a president, which we have seen in in modern times. I can't believe I've lived long enough to sit in (laughs) three impeachment trials for uh, President Clinton, Bill Clinton, uh, and then twice for uh, Donald Trump. So um, with the judicial branch, the judicial branch is a different species. These are all the federal judges, and there are, uh, depending on how you count them, uh, 1,500 to 3,000 of them in the country. And then there are uh, magistrates and special masters and people who operate underneath them. Well, every federal judge under the Supreme Court, and these are district courts and uh, appellate courts, circuit courts, uh, and special courts like tax courts and military courts and courts uh, like the federal court of claims where other countries come to sue the federal government, the United States government, et cetera, et cetera. Am I boring you? I hope not. No, no. <laughs> no, um, no this, is, this is very intriguing. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I do have kind of an, an aside question and then you can go right back into this, okay? Sure. So. Uh, you know, obviously, well, you, you got support from from Democrats um, on the House Judiciary Committee, but uh, you know, a Republican said you you're not credible, um, except for Matt Gates. So you know the machinations of this world more than most. Why is Matt Gates supporting your appeal for? Uh, Supreme Court ethics legislation and transparency? Well, you know, up until very recently, Republicans have historically been very critical of the federal judiciary. Number one, they don't like the idea that, as Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia said himself once, uh, you know, this court is made up of nine unelected lawyers who try to tell the rest of the country what to do. They don't like the idea that, for example, 
you know, the Congress can uh, pass laws as the duly elected representatives of the people, the president of the United States chosen, I'd like to say, by a majority of the American people, but mm -hmm. that has never been true. Uh, with the Electoral College and the way it works, but at least has a, a plurality of Americans who elect the president who signs the law, uh, who signs the bill into law, actually makes it law with a signature. Then the Supreme Court, or in many cases, lower courts, can just weigh in and sign, uh, you know, sign it out of existence. Mm. Republicans have been very critical of that. They haven't liked federal judges for a long time. But of they course, haven't liked unelected officials. So does that explain why Republicans are so gung ho for voting rights? <laughs> <laughs> and here's where we get into so much hypocrisy, double standards, and you know what I. What I just wrote about, and I have a column on Patheos, and I just wrote about a Trumpian form of terrorism, which is arbitrariness. It's mm. what I say is the rule right now mm. for my own reasons, but the rules might change in a second mm -hmm. uh, when I say they change. And you get treated one way and my friends get treated another way. And we keep the power to ourselves to keep you from getting the power. And whatever it takes to do that, we will make the rule and the law for the moment. And that, of course, one keeps of the... everybody in terror. It is a form of yeah. terrorism. Terror is, yeah. One of terror is a really powerful and appropriate word. Thank you so much for being here today. We are people who have left behind performance-based religion and the shame that comes with it. Maybe you have a personal liberation story to tell and we want to know about it. Please contact us on Twitter at God is not an asshole or text 805-703-8393 because the world needs to know that God is not an asshole.